I was just about to joke, I picked that passage to make my read some difficult words, and then God, I guess, sent me a message. <laughs> I'm joking about that kind of stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right. So earlier this week, I was driving to work, going down Shop Road, when the car in front of me slammed on its brakes and it stopped on a dime. Now, I, too, slammed on my brakes, but unfortunately, it was too late, and I hit into the back of the car in front of me. Thus, I was in a car wreck. That was the thing I didn't mention in the prayers, but a young lady that was in the car, her name is Shawan Johnson. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing her name, but that's why I asked you all to pray for her. Now, I pulled off the road and checked on Miss Johnson. She appeared to be pregnant, uh, and she also had a child in the back seat. Now, she repeatedly said that she was okay. She didn't need an ambulance or anything like that, and that her son was okay. He was strapped into the car seat. So we exchanged information. I took a photo of her car and mine. Uh, and if y'all are so inclined, in fact, you can look out and see it in the parking lot now. It's, my car caught the worst of it, for sure. Um, now, Miss Johnson, she left after the accident before law enforcement arrived. But when they did, thankfully, they didn't write me a ticket or find me at fault. And he actually gave me like a fill-it-out-yourself accident form, which I've never seen before. Didn't think that was a thing. Um, but he said, yeah, take this, you know, if you need to give it to your insurance company. And as it turned out, I did. So, as long as everybody wasn't hurt and, you know, didn't get found at fault, everything was all good and all okay, right? Well, not necessarily. Uh, because as I found out when I took my car to the body shop on Garner's Ferry Road, they informed me and they said, well, your car is a little old, it's not worth much, so the insurance company might not pay for this. They might declare your car a total loss and, you know, write you a check, which, you know, I might have told you before, I don't really like my car, so it wouldn't be the, the worst thing in the world. But on the other hand, that would mean I'd have to buy a new car and have a car payment, and that's not great either. But more importantly, I was fine. As I figured out later, you know, I thought it's the next morning that really counts when you figure out, am I sore, am I hurting, and as it turned out, I was fine. But the reason I asked y'all to pray for Ms. Johnson is because what if she is not okay? Now, she told me repeatedly that she was and that her child was, but then when uh, I spoke to my insurance company later that afternoon, they said, well, just so you know, the other party is reporting injury. I don't know what kind of injury. Uh, I don't know if it's her or her son, but that's why I ask that we all pray to make sure that she's okay. Now, the point of me telling you this story uh, is to say that it occurred to me, probably sometime shortly thereafter, after the accident, that life can change in an instant. You know, here I was riding pretty high, going to work. On Tuesday morning, I had an interesting weekend the, the weekend before. Uh, got to meet the president, watch Duke win the basketball game the night before. Going to, they didn't win last night, but anyways, I was on the way to work in just another day, and all of a sudden, life changes just like that. Now, fortunately for me, it didn't change my car with disagree, but for me, it didn't change that much. I am fine, and I pray that Ms. Johnson is fine. But it occurred to me how, but for the grace of God, it could have been much worse. It could have been much different. I could be walking up here right now on crutches, or I could not be here because it could have been bad. You just never know. It's dangerous to be out there on the roadways. Um, but one may... It, my, what I really realized and the point I'm trying to make is one day you could be doing something mundane that you do every day and all of a sudden your life could change forever and not necessarily in a good way. But as we see 
examples in Scripture that I'm going to go over. Sometimes it changes for the better. Sometimes it does not. What are we to take away from this concept that life could change on a dime from a biblical perspective? How should this enhance or uh, further allow us to understand our faith? And God's role in our lives and what he would have us do, what his ultimate plan for him, us individually and as humanity is. Is this to say that we should live in our lives in bubble wrap and never go outside? Because you could get into a car wreck. Now, although we pray for folks that have COVID right now, I think hopefully we learn from the experience of COVID that that's not how you're supposed to live. We're all here today. So we're wearing masks right now. So there are dangers that you have to face in life. And one thing at least I personally learned from COVID is that at some point you got to get out there and live a little, despite the risks that are abundant in life. So what are we to take from this concept that life can change in a dime, that God, maybe things would happen to us that God doesn't necessarily plan but they could ultimately play into God's ultimate plan for our lives. Well, let's consider some characters in the Bible whose life may be changed in the incident. First and foremost, beginning of the book we're reading from today, Adam and Eve. One day they're living life in paradise. And then, because of the serpent, what he encouraged Eve to do, the next day they are cast out of Eden. And they are no longer living a life of paradise. They are living a life of toil and difficulty. Their lives changed in an instant and not for the better. Now, consider another example from the Old Testament. Moses was in exile because he was a murderer. Moses killed somebody. We forget about that. Moses killed an Egyptian. And one fateful day when he's tending his flock... He hears a voice from a burning bush who tells him that he is to go and lead God's people out of Egypt into the promised land. I'm guessing when Moses got up that day, he didn't think that his life was going to change in that manner. And yet, he becomes a leader of God's people, leads everybody, leads the Israelites out of Egypt. His life changed for the better. Staying in the Old Testament, we have the example of Nadab and Abihu. Y'all don't know who Nadab and Abihu are, you are, unless you're real biblical scholars, but they are the sons of Aaron. Leviticus chapter 10 tells us that they're engaging in an act of worship in front of the altar that God said was holy, and they didn't do something correctly, so God consumes them with fire right then and there. They're... Lives ended in an instant. David, we all know who David is. He was just a shepherd boy until he killed Goliath. And then he became king. So he rose to prominence quickly, but just as quickly he also fell because of his sin with Uriah and Bathsheba, or sin with Bathsheba and what he did ordering Uriah to his death. Let's think about a more uh, a New Testament example. I know that's what y'all are all waiting for. We, we talk about the New Testament more often, don't we? That Old Testament can be uh, kind of boring sometimes. And, and not, not boring, but you don't always make the connections. How does this affect our lives as Christians? Well, think about four disciples in particular. We hear in several of the Gospels, Peter and Andrew are just in a boat fishing. All of a sudden, Peter, Jesus comes by and says, Come and follow me. Same with John and James, son of Zebedee. Their lives changed in an instant. They didn't think when they got up that morning, I'm going to change my life forever from here on out and start following this guy, Jesus. And finally, perhaps the best example of somebody whose life changed completely is Saul. Saul is on the road to Damascus. When he is blinded, all of a sudden, Jesus Appears to him and says, you're going to stay blind until you go into town and meet this guy. And then you're going to stop persecuting me and my people. And then Saul changes his name to Paul and goes on to write half of the Old Testament. 
And finally, our scripture lesson from today. Now, how much quicker could your life change than what, how Joseph's changed? And his life didn't change just once. It changed several times, both for good and for bad. His father, Jacob, also known as Israel, he sends him out to tend the sheep. He says, go out and tend the sheep with your brothers. And as we read in our call to worship, he never comes back that day. He's going out just to tend sheep, and all of a sudden, his brothers throw him into a cistern, which is like a big stone pot. And uh, then, you know, first they're going to kill him. So imagine his thought when he gets thrown in there, and like, I'm, they're talking about killing me. Now, when I was younger, my brother, you know, he did some mean things to me. He joined the wrestling team, and he practices moves on me, and, you know, kind of, Put me into pain. That stopped, by the way, when I started wrestling. I got better than him. But um, I can't ever imagine that, that if the worst thing my brother had ever did to me was put me in a wrestling move I didn't want to be put in. I can't imagine being thrown into a jar by your brothers and saying, yeah, we're going to kill you. Um, and not only that, one of them comes forward, uh, Judah, and he says, no, don't kill him. Let's just sell, sell him into slavery because that's so much better, right? So his life changed for the worse. But things aren't as bad as they seem. As we go on to here, I didn't include this in the scripture lesson. There'd be more difficult names for my paraphrase to read. But things aren't so bad. He lives in a man named Potiphar's house, and he's got a pretty good life. As he is still in slavery, but he's living in this guy's house, and things are going good. That is until Potiphar's wife makes a pass at him and says... Won't say what she said to him for polite things in church uh, to talk about. But then when he refuses, he's honorable. And then Potiphar's wife accuses him of making a pass at her. And Potiphar throws Joseph into prison. So he goes from being sold into slavery, things aren't bad, living in a house. Now he's in prison. And then you think things are going to start turning around from for Joseph because we've already heard that he's a dreamer. His... Uh, Brothers refer to him derisively as that dreamer. Uh, and he has a dream when he's in prison, or he gives an interpretation, rather, to the cupbearer of Pharaoh. Tells him about a dream, and he's like, that's my key out, right? You're going to finally get out of this prison? Cupbearer forgets all about Joseph and leaves him alone. That is until Pharaoh has a dream about seven fat cows coming out of the Nile and then seven ugly cows coming out of the Nile. And he says, what is this about? The cupbearer says, I know a guy. I know a guy that can tell you that. And then he comes to Joseph, and Joseph interprets the dream for Pharaoh. He says, the seven fat cows represent seven years of abundance that will come in Egypt. We'll have plenty of crops, plenty of grain. Everything's going to be awesome. However... There will be seven years thereafter of famine. The seven years of famine are not going to be good. Nothing's going to grow, and we're not going to have any of the stuff we did in the seven years of abundance. So we have to prepare for that. We have to prepare for the seven years of famine that will eventually happen. And for his efforts, our scripture lesson tells us that Joseph goes from not being a slave, but being a slave in prison all of a sudden rising up to being second in command to Pharaoh. He's basically, besides Pharaoh, he's the highest guy in Egypt. You know, he gets a signet ring, he gets to marry someone's daughter, he gets to live in this palace, and everybody comes to Joseph and says, you know, even Pharaoh says, go talk to Joseph. Don't ask me. He knows what to do. And Joseph does what God no doubt intended him to do. He stores away grain during the seven years of abundance, and it not only benefits everybody in Egypt, but it benefits everybody in the surrounding areas, the surrounding countries, who did not take those seven years of uh, abundance, did not plan for them as well. They were living high and mighty, I guess, high on the hog, and they didn't save grain like Joseph did. So Joseph's brothers ultimately come to buy grain from Joseph during the seven years of famine. And thus, 
the story goes on and we all know the rest of the story of Genesis. But considering this and how Joseph's station in life changed from good to bad to worse to being about as good as possible, what does that mean? mean for us? What are we supposed to take from that? So you've told us, Scott, you can, you know, we might leave here and life could change in an instant. We could get in a car wreck. What does that mean for us? How can we take that and use it? Well, the key to that or answer to that is when Joseph's brothers come to him after Joseph's father dies, Jacob dies, and Joseph's brothers come to him and they try to play another trick on him. And they're like, oh, let's tell them that dad said right before he died, please forgive your brothers. You know, don't ever like hold anything against them. And they say that to Joseph. And Joseph can tell that they're full of baloney. And he says, I'll read it directly so I can get uh, the scripture right. Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me. But God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So, what God meant, so what Joseph's brothers meant for evil was actually meant for good. And it's not something that Joseph was in a position to find out right away. We don't know, I mean, roughly speaking, this has been... This is sometime during the years of famine, so this is kind of could have developed over as many as 14 years for this promise to take place. Now, God can kind of see this. He has kind of a 30,000-foot view, but we as human beings, as God's creation, we can't see that in the moment when Joseph gets thrown into a pot and they're talking about how they're going to kill them, uh, his brothers are going to kill them, and then sell them to slavery. He doesn't see anything good at that moment. He can't take the bird's eye view that God has and say, don't worry, this is all part of God's plan. God has greater things in mind. This is very kind of similar to the story of Job. Job doesn't know that God has an ultimate purpose behind his suffering. He just knows, I'm suffering, and he doesn't curse God at the moment, but he's tempted to. He's tempted to by his friends. So we don't know what God's purpose for our life might be. We, something bad might happen to us, and it could be, and we won't know it for maybe now, maybe a year from now, several years from now, that it was all part of God's plan. Had we had a children's sermon this morning, I was going to tell the story of once upon a time when I was absolutely sure that I was going to attend Duke University. I was like, I'm getting in there. There's no way. I'm not getting my brother went there, my dad went there. And then I got this letter that said, We know this comes as a surprise considering your family's connections to the school, but you're not getting in. So they were saying, We realize that you're a legacy, but you're still not getting in. You're that bad that you can't get into the school. Now, needless to say, as an 18 year old kid, I didn't take that well. Now my dad took me out to Arby's. And that soothed the pain just a little bit. But looking back on it, I can't imagine that decision turning out differently. I've had the benefit of 20 years of hindsight since then, 19 to be exact. But my 18-year-old self at the time thought, this is the worst thing ever. How could you do this to me, God? And now I look back on it and say, how could you not have done that to me, God? That was the thing that was meant to happen. I didn't know that I needed at that time, because my life wouldn't be the same if that letter had turned out differently, if it had gone in the other direction. I didn't see that 30,000-foot view that God had for my life. Now, this may not always be a comforting thought. You know, if I had gotten into a terrible car accident and I was coming in here in a wheelchair or with crutches or not coming in here at all, I don't think I would have been very comforted if you had come in and said, it's all part of God's plan, Scott. And indeed, that's what a pastor mentor of mine would say. You should never, ever say it to somebody who's suffered loss if you're counseling somebody. You shouldn't say, oh, don't worry, it's all part of God's plan, because that's not a very comforting thought. 
But for those of you that might not be comforted by that, and if you were in a position where you had to comfort somebody and you felt, well, it's not a good idea to say it's just all part of God's plan because we don't know God's plan. We don't know what he has in mind. Consider this. One of the first sermons I ever preached at Zion, I know you remember all my sermons in detail, but this is probably like my third sermon here. I preached on the book of Revelation, chapter 22. And the point of that story was not so much to focus on Revelation because I'm not a biblical scholar to know all the ins and outs of Revelation, but my point was to say we know how the book ends. We know what happens in the end. If you watch a movie for the tenth time over, which I'm known to do, you don't get all frustrated during the, the tense parts because you're like, oh, I know what happens in the end. The Death Star blows up in the end. They win. you know. Or if you watch an old game on TV and you say, I'm not going to get upset when my team's down by 20 points because I know they come back and win. We know how this book ends. We know how our lives will end if we are faithful and if we remain faithful to Jesus through trials and tribulations to the end of the age. Jesus tells us he will be with us to the end of the age. And we hear and read in Revelation that God ultimately triumphs over evil, defeats Satan, and establishes kingdom here anew here on earth. So, if my first thought about we just don't know God's plan wasn't a comfort to you, think about it in, the, in that perspective. In the ultimate scheme, the ultimate story of our lives, the ultimate story of humanity, God wins in the end. Now, there will be trials and tribulations, ups and downs in the middle, but ultimately, the, the people of faith, those who believe in Jesus Christ, come out on top in the end. Let that be a comfort to you when we, as we go forth from here, knowing that although life may change in an instant, God's ultimate plan for humanity does not. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.